50 years ago this July, NASA's Apollo 11 mission landed the first men on the moon on what was history's greatest voyage of discovery. Getting Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins to the moon and back was the culmination of a national effort launched by President John F. Kennedy in 1961. But achieving the goal of landing man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth by the end of the 1960s would involve half a million people, America's industrial and scientific might, and cost billions of dollars to develop new materials and technologies that changed the world. And four Apollo missions paved the way for Armstrong and Aldrin to make their first lunar landing. To commemorate the anniversary, award-winning filmmaker Todd Douglas Miller, who won acclaim for his movie Dinosaur 13 about finding the largest T-Rex, produced a new documentary, Apollo 11, composed entirely of historical footage, some never seen before, and audio from the mission itself, telling the gripping tale of an incredible voyage that riveted the world's attention in July 1969 and inspired generations. Before its general release at regular theaters and IMAX theaters worldwide, I asked Miller why it's so important to commemorate Apollo 11. Given that space fans were disappointed that the 50th anniversary of the first mission to the moon, Apollo 8, went by with such little fanfare in December. Let me just talk about Apollo 8 first off, because that was the first time that uh, you know we went behind the moon. Didn't know what was going to happen. So uh, to be out of communication, uh, the fact that uh, Lovell and his crew um, uh, you know, did that uh, heroic mission really paved the way for the rest of the Apollo series. So once we got to 11, um, which by the way I was negative 7 when uh, Apollo 11 happened, um, I am certainly uh, a product of the shuttle, uh, I remember that error, and uh, Apollo uh, uh, being the ancestor to uh, the shuttle program uh, was immensely important. Um, and having worked on this film now, Apollo 11, and seeing uh, just doing all the research and the deep dive into uh, just not only what the astronauts went through, but all of those hundreds of thousands of people um, at Mission Control, all the various companies that built uh, these uh, 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 fantastic vehicles, just not the spacecraft, the LEM and the, and the you know, command module, but also the vehicles that got them there, the Saturn V. Um, hundreds of thousands of people spread across tens of thousands of, of companies. Uh, it was just a, a mind-boggling number uh, of, of people that came together to accomplish uh, something in a short amount of time uh, and, and was just such a, a great accomplishment. Um, that uh, I, I think is uh, really unparalleled in, in, in humanity. Yeah, that's right, because in 1961, when John Kennedy said, before this decade has out, land a man on the moon and return him safely to the Earth, and, and we, uh, we did it. Uh, Rick, why is it so important, from your standpoint, aside from a family connection, to commemorate this important achievement? The, the biggest thing that I hear about this is people come up to me and say, you know, I, I was a kid, I saw this, I was inspired to be whatever it is they became because of, of, of the Apollo program. And I've heard that time and time and time again, and I know there are so many people out there in the U.S. and probably all over the world, really, that were really motivated to, to make something of themselves because of this. And, and I don't know any better legacy than that. And, and hopefully this film will provide some sense of ins that same kind of inspiration for the kids of today. Uh, that, they'll, that they'll go on and to do, you know, to, to whatever they dream of doing. Um, well, it inspired me. Apollo 8 was my first memory as a little kid, and I remember the moon landing. You know, my dad woke me up, you know, so that we could uh, uh, we could uh, we could watch it. Um, and for for me, a lot of it was like, was somebody born before or after the moon landing? It was kind of a dividing uh, uh, line for me. Um, so, why? What inspired you? to uh, Todd to make this picture, but also take the narrative style that you did. There is no narrator on it. You use a lot of real-time footage. The landing is in real time. The liftoff is in exact real time. Talk to us a little bit about what inspired you to make the movie and why to pick that uh, method of storytelling. Well, uh, from the very beginning, one thing that always inspired me uh, was listening to the public affairs officers. Uh, they sat right next to, uh, in mission control, right next to the flight director uh, and the other flight controllers. And they really were um, 
the voice uh, of America, uh, of the world. Uh, they, they, uh, they, first of all, they had the, the voices of airline pilots, a uh, very calming, soothing thing. So uh, these amazingly complex uh, things were going on. Uh, and if you had Michael Collins on com or Neil Armstrong or Buzz Aldrin, um, even though they were amazingly complex, uh, things that they were doing, uh, some of the docking, undocking, of course, the landing, um, uh, the, the public affairs officers just had a way of explaining it uh, to the public in layman's terms, so someone like me could understand. Uh, so it was just a natural fit um, uh, for us to uh, utilize them to tell the story. But also, um, w uh, shortly into uh, the production, we were exposed to a large cache of, uh, of audio, uh, Mission Control audio, um, over 18,000 hours of Apollo-related audio, uh, audio 11,000 hours of that was related to Apollo 11. Um, and it was just an absolutely uh, fantastical uh, voyage to listen to all these guys um, uh, working in unison uh, in four-man shifts 24-7, uh, spanning nine days of the mission. So um, it, it, to me, I always felt like, I always liked films that uh, dealt uh, with uh, direct cinema approach um, that had uh, uh, you know, a creative style that puts you right there in the moment. And the minute that um, you, you saw some of the materials that were shot by the astronauts, some of the photographs taken by the astronauts, uh, you're right there with uh, cameras that were shot in mission control. Even way before we had the large format, um, we always knew, uh, even with the other materials, that that's what we were going to do. And then once we had the large format material, it was, you know, it was, of course, that's exactly uh, the style in which we tell the story. Um, I'm going to ask you uh, about uh, that in a second because you used some of Theo Kameki's uh, stuff, uh, uh, the, the director of Moonwalk One. So, how did uh, he do in telling a story that you've seen and heard and read about count countless times? Well, it's so compelling. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, t uh, the way that they put this film together makes you feel like it's happening right now, and I, I think that was a, a brilliant choice, uh, rather than to use the narration and the, this is how it was back then right. kind of thing. To feel like you're watching it now, and then with the 70 millimeter footage in there, and you, you really feel like if this was happening today, this is how it would be covered. So uh, I, I noticed that from the first preview that I got of the film that, that that's what they were going to do and I thought oh this is an awesome choice. Which interesting to note the first time that we were exposed to large format footage for the first people that we thought of was the families and the astronauts uh, and I, I I know I went out to uh, to meet with Rick and his brother uh, and we kind of had a clandestine screening on a on a laptop um, but it was one of the greatest joys of my life to you know to be privileged enough to have that footage and then to share it, uh, you know, uh, with these guys. And, and what happens to the rest of this footage? Because uh, the stuff that Kameki shot has been sort of sitting around. I mean, you found it at the archives. Yeah, uh, the current thinking today was that uh, Theo Kameka, who worked for Francis Thompson of the Francis Thompson Company, uh, it's a fantastic story. They did a come a cult classic among space fans called Moonwalk One. Current thinking was that all this footage was shot for that. Um, not true. They actually, uh, Jillian Shearer was a great PR director at NASA at the time, uh, commissioned Moonwalk One, but they were shooting on these large format, Todd AO formatted Mitchell cameras, uh, certainly uh, to tail end of the Gemini program, uh, in through Apollo 8, and then doing almost dress rehearsals up until Apollo 11 uh, and beyond. Uh, so, But the beauty of what Kamika brought to it was artistry. Uh, he had two really great cinematographers, and Iris Fuhr, they called him the bear, he was hand holding a lot of these Mitchell cameras uh, with these giant lenses on them, these hand, you know, ingenue, like amazing um, uh, hand uh, made lenses. Uh, and another guy, Jan Spoan, and it was a Dutch filmmaker they brought over, got these wonderful beach scenes uh, the night, uh, the morning of the, uh, of the launch, all the pre-launch stuff. Um, and these guys just knew what they were doing. Um, so we certainly uh, owe just a, a tremendous debt of gratitude um, to those cinematographers and those filmmakers. Unfortunately, we lost Theo uh, in the production of the film um, and a couple other you know large format giants as well and that's we dedicate the film uh, you know to their legacy um, it's extraordinary I'm getting the hook so let me ask one question um, talk to us a little bit about commemoration events this year uh, how it's going to culminate what are some of the things we're going to do so that folks can follow along uh, in this uh, incredible uh, Germany I'm sort of waiting for you know some of those details myself I know there's going to be something going on here in D.C. on the 20th. I think the spacesuit gets uh, that space 
suit gets revealed here at the Smithsonian. Uh, there's a, there's a big event down at Kennedy Space Center on the 16th. There's something at Marshall on the same night. Uh, there's something at the Museum of Flight out in Seattle. Uh, and I'm sure I'm missing some. So uh, yeah, it's 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 probably I'm not going to be able to go to all of them, unfortunately, until I, unless I figure out how to clone myself. Uh, but there's still time. Look, yeah, yeah, well, waiting for a breakthrough. Uh, but yeah, looking forward to it. And uh, what's uh, what's next? What what happens? I mean, what's your next project? More space stuff, and how soon before all of this stuff is digitized so that folks can actually see this extraordinary footage? Well, that's the second half of our project. Just isn't the film, but also uh, the digitization of all these materials, and also the curation and the preservation. So we're working very closely with uh, National Archives, with NASA, uh, about making these uh, materials available. Uh, so. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a very long process. Uh, we have the film uh, and all our deliverables, but then we also have, you know, petabytes of, of information that uh, needs to be uh, archived properly. And it's just not on our end. Uh, it's also on, uh, on National Archives end as well. So we're working through all of those workflows uh, and hopefully have some, you know, really nice announcements here in the upcoming months. Todd uh, Douglas Miller, uh, director of Apollo 11, extraordinary movie, astonishing is uh, an understatement, and Rick Armstrong, uh, son of uh, Neil Armstrong, I had the honor of meeting your dad, and it was uh, one of the real honors of my life, and it's great to have met uh, two uh, Armstrongs. Thank Gentlemen, thank thanks you. very much, and we look forward to doing what we can to help tell the Apollo 11 uh, and the Apollo and the Moon program story as well. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And in case you were wondering, you can find a Freeze Mitchell Todd AO camera on eBay. Thanks very much for joining us as always.